Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the second half of our South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network doubleheader. Some few familiar faces on the front end. Uh, we have actually Smoking Jeremy B is the only familiar face from the front end. Everybody else was chatting, which is okay, too. We need to contribute all the way. Anyways, 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. Love doing it with this crew and all the other people that we have involved in the program. And I'll introduce the crew right to left. Eric Katz, welcome back, big guy. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be back. George Icorn is back. Good to be back. Thank you. He's one of those individuals who had to take a little time to refresh himself a little. We don't want nobody to be burned out. And now he's wearing the appropriate tire on top of his grill. So that's good. And Jordan Long. Thanks for having me, Scott. You're my pleasure. And last but not least, long time no see here. Jeremy, not. I'm here? Oh, okay. Hi. How is everybody doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least, you know, they got the two hats and I got mine. The Motor City Mad Mouth hat. It's all well and good. And the unofficial sixth member of the crew, when I say unofficial, Will Vogel. Here we go. Let's put him up there, Jeremy. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Will Vogel. Hey, and Vogel. the se second one, before it gets busy again, I'm ready to hit a home run with these. Guys. Boy, I'll tell you, Will. Uh, uh, I'll are... be happy if you do pull off a suicide squeeze bunt down the third baseline. Well, I prefer to leave suicide. I'll just call it a squeeze bunt. <laughs> just, uh, just, 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 get, just, get, just get on base, Roadrunner. There you go. All right. I need that. I need that hat. Okay. We'll see what happens. Well, well, we, we send hats out as we get them, but these two guys, we'll keep you in mind. Good evening, South Florida Tribune. That means it's candy time. Yes. All right. Before I get, we get to business here. Just want to let everybody know that 108 stitches baseball talk is being broadcast around the world. The audio version of this show can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a 1,000 subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? No problem. Participate in the chat room. That's only a way to do it. Or send topic ideas to southfloridatribune at gmail.com. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, call me at 954-304-4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website is www.southfloridatribune.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Tribune South. Candy Evelyn is behind the scenes, and she is our MVP because she gets it all done the right way. Coming later this summer, the Motor City Mad Mouth Show will be debuting on the Eagle Court Media Studios in Boca Raton, Florida, owned by Dr. Edwin Hernandez. We'll keep you posted. The Eagle Corp is a technology-based company here in Palm Beach County. With that said, okay, I'm looking forward to doing that show as I end every opportunity I get to get behind the mic and talk to some great people. All right, without any further delay, our first topic, will any of these three players get in the Hall of Fame? We're going to talk to Pete Rose, 4,256 hits, Barry Bond, 756 home runs, Roger Clemens, seven Cy Youngs. All right, we're going to go right to left all night, and we're going to start with Eric. Go ahead, Eric. I think uh, Pete, not, not until he's dead, Pete Rose. Um, Roger Clemens, I'd like for him to get in. Problem is the whole st the whole accusation of steroid thing because in the baseball writer's eyes, it's guilty until proven innocent, which thank God our courts don't work like that. But um, and then the and then who's who's the second one, Scott? Well, you have you have Pete Rose. You said no on him. Yeah, not until he's dead. Okay, not until he's dead. Barry Bonds. Uh, would like to see, would like to, but I doubt the writers are going to let him in. Okay, and then you also mentioned Roger Clemens. Yeah, want to see him get in. Just um, unfortunately, this whole steroid thing is going to keep him out for right now. Okay, George Icorn. Well, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm not optimistic about Rose at all. I don't think he's going to make it at all, either way, alive or dead. Uh, Barry Bonds, yeah, eventually they're going to come around. He's going to make it. And same with Roger Clements, I believe, also. They're just too good, too strong cases for both of them that cannot be ignored for um, uh, their lifetimes. I think they'll get in by those two select committees that pick the uh, the old timers. They don't call it that anymore, but Legends of the Game, whatever it's called. Those select committees, I think, will take care of Bonds and Roger. But sorry, Pete Rose. No. Nope. Okay. Jordan? I would love to see Pete Rose go in. I understand that he gambled and bet on baseball. But the fact of the matter is, is how is that any worse than steroids in my eyes? Because it's 
he at least didn't cheat as far as we know to alter a game. We know Sarah Rice did, so I think Pete Rose should be in because of the fact that he has so many hits, but people are going to say he's already in because of the records. I don't see Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens because of the steroid factor. I agree with you. And you know what? Pete Rose will get in when he's dead. He's not going to get in alive. No way. And if you've ever been in the Hall of Fame, must-do bucket list deal, Pete Rose's paraphernalia is all over the place. The only thing that isn't there is a plaque, and that's it. The only thing that really hurt him a little bit publicity-wise is you don't go selling your book Mm -hmm. during Hall of Fame weekend. If that isn't El Stupido 101, I don't know what about Spanish, but I always used to know El Stupido because I had a lot of Spanish people call me that, but they didn't like me. Otherwise, you could take whatever Spanish I know and throw it out the window. But all right, let's well, let's get Will Vogel's comment, Jeremy. I think only Rose he's, because he's up there on hits. Barry Bonds, no, because of steroids. Roger Clemens, maybe because of wins, but overall, no, because of steroids. Okay, with that said, give me your thoughts, Jeremy. I personally feel because <clears throat> the MLB actually condoned steroid use till at the end of that era. They need to have an asterisk wing and put everybody that has the numbers to make it in that wing that has been proven to have done steroids. Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Roger Clemens, Barry Bonds, and there's a plethora of others. What's the other guy? The the one that, that was it, Ken no. Caminiti, the big first baseman that went from a twig to like a monster. So all those guys belong in that wing. And as far as Pete Rose, he'll get in when he's dead because they won't care until then. Right. It's funny how you mentioned that too, Jeremy. When I was at the Hall of Fame with my wife, Candy, last year, they did have a exhibit there with all the steroid people in it. So it's not like they're not, not honoring the history, mentioning the history of the game. But I agree with you. Asterisks, they should put a point where there's an asterisk on it. If there's ever an asterisk that belongs, it would be on that. All right. On to the next topic. I saw yet another dominant outing by Marlins rookie, Yuri Perez, the kid's only 20 years old, as he struck out nine and scattered four hits, just one walk in the Marlins two to nothing win over the over Pittsburgh Pirates Sunday afternoon to improve to five and one. Sorry, Mark Mancini, you know, you know this kid's awfully good, and the Pirates lost three of four to the Marlins, but that doesn't break my heart, and I don't think it breaks Eric Cash's heart either. So with that said, Eric, let's focus on the task at hand. What do you think of this twenty-year-old kid? Dude, he's off to find his way. Somewhere. Oh, he, he, you know, he's a borderline rookie. The, he's going to be a rookie of the year candidate for sure. I'm not sure. I'm um, just given the popularity of Corbin Carroll that if he's going to win it, but I know he's got a a very good chance. He's a big reason why the Marlins are in the position they're in now, and you know, not the only reason because you know because there are others there. But you know, Yuri Perez is, you know, what I think. You know, he's it's basically like a young Sandy Alcantara all over again. The guy, the guy's just flat out filthy and dominant. I mean, you know, they, they actually plucked him out. They didn't get him in a trade. They kind of plucked him from international free agency, I think out of the Dominican Republic, but what a find he has become. All right, let's go to the chat room. All right. Well, Jeremy gets a double dip here. You get to read them. I think only Rose because he's up there and hits. Barry Bonds, no because of steroids. Roger Cummins, maybe because of wins, but overall, no because of steroids. Okay, let's go. Let's continue on. And, and, and I'm Paul Rick, also known as Smoking Dad. Hey, guys, I still think Rose should be in the Hall of Fame, in my opinion. All right, you know what? I also want to mention something about Kenny. He made a very timely comment, which was much appreciated last night when I had Buddy Bianco on. on and, he, and we were talking about you know, zone motion. And Ken mentioned Mickey Lowe's. Ken, that was unbelievable. It really was. Because Mickey Lowe's was certainly in a zone during the 1968 World Series. And if there was ever a timely comment at the right time, Ken nailed it with a bullseye. All right. And then we'll go ahead on the well, and then we'll continue to roll through them. All right. Go ahead, Jeremy. Marlon's got two young pictures, El Contra, uh, El Cantera and Perez. But Perez is helping the team trem- tremendously along with El Cantera and Areas. Yeah, I'm hoping um, Sandy will get it turned around a little bit later in the Parisa. season. Yeah, all oh, Arias. Arias. This, this Arias. guy is unbelievable. Oh, I swear. I mean, I watched this guy have two five hit games, and he's a, he's one guy that has gone out there and hit for the first cycle in Marlins history. And when I was talking about promoting this show, how they had a straight up trade with the Minnesota Twins for Pablo Lopez, who isn't innings eater. 
Minnesota needed pitching and the Marlins not arise. And I can tell you the early returns on the trade are looking awfully good for Kim Ng and the Marlins. So with that said, George, take over. Well, Perez is, yeah, he's on a roll. He's a good kid. Got a lot of potential. I've seen this before, obviously, over the long stretch with Mark the Bird Fitterich in 1976. I'm sure there have been other cases of pitchers, young pitchers coming up and doing this kind of thing. Uh, but let's see how he can handle it. Uh, you know, the, the Marlins have really turned things around this year, as you guys mentioned, and it's uh, no surprise that uh, good pitching is one of the reasons why they turned it around. But I'm pulling for him. He's got a lot of excitement in in, in just to the fact that he is uh, such a consistent winner so far, and he he, he strikes guys out, he does the right things, and uh, I'm hoping for more of it from Perez. I, I hope the, the Cinderella season continues for him. All right, before I turn it over to <coughs> Jordan, Jeremy, continue on with Will. We already we just said that one. Okay, so we'll move on to the next one. Loved your interview with Skip Schumacher, Scott. I think he could be up for Manager of the Year award. Boy, you are so dead accurate there, Will. All right, Jordan. So with Perez, I mean, it's I agree with Eric that he's a uh, Rookie of the Year candidate. I mean, oh. the guy is five and one in his nine stars. He, like um, George was saying, he can also strike batters out. He has fifty-four strikeouts. I mean, it's it's unbelievable to see a guy who is five and one doing what he's doing at the major league level, because you see these guys, t- you know, Peter off. And hopefully if he continues this, he will be, you know, a 20 game winner this year. I mean, 10 is probably where he's going to end up 10 to 15, 20 would be unbelievable. And that could actually get him into the Cy Young conversation. But for right now, I mean, he's five and one, he's pitching very well. And that's all you want to see. Before we turn over to Jeremy, there's a little bit of love in the chat room and we're going to tell her we love yeah. her back. Right. Felicity Jane. Yeah. We Felicity love you as well. Says, Hello, Felicity guys. Jean. Keep it up. I love you all. We Thank love you, too. We love Felicity you, too. Jean. We appreciate you coming in and saying that. We, feelings mutual. All right. Go ahead, Jeremy. I mean, what can you say? This kid's out of sight. He's just been lighting it up, keeping people off the base pass. That's how, how teams get to win games easily. And as long as he keeps that up, I think 15 to 20 is the more than likely landing spot for wins this year. Okay. Yeah, pretty hard to doubt. I mean, this kid's, he's only going to get better. And the, But the one constant that you have throughout the Marlins pitching is Mel Stottlemyre Jr. This guy is the one coach that they ended up retaining, and Mel is doing a fine job with the Marlins. And you know, Skip Schumacher, I've talked to him a couple times. Appear, they appear to have made a really good hire with the guy. You know, he's a younger guy, although I, I, no, I kid you not, Don Mattingly is my guy, no matter what. I mean, Don and I have such a great connection. But, you know, they agreed to mutually part ways. Don's with Toronto, and Skip is doing a fine job. I mean, I know Will's right on target. I think it's possible he could be a manager of the year candidate. We'll see how the season plays on. All right, well. Let's talk about the LA Angels. And I know that a man, Jordan Long, has been very vocal about it in his thing. So we'll get to you in a minute while you process what everybody's got to say. The LA Angels 25 to 1 over the Colorado Rockies. The Halos held a 24 to nothing lead through six innings. Each team added a run in the eighth. Final line score the Angels 25 28 0. Colorado 1 7 0. 23 runs in the first four innings. But after the blowout loss, the Angels acquired Mike Moustakis from the Rockies. So, mm-hmm. had a lot to bite out there. All right, Eric, go ahead. I mean, clearly the clearly the Rockies couldn't couldn't pitch that night, if ever. And um, and you know, it comes to show you just how dangerous it is for arms at at Coors Field because man, the ball just flies there. As far as Moustakis getting acquired by the Angels, well, that's in response because Euro Shell has been lost for the year. And then also, I believe Anthony Rendon is hurt. So, you know, there's there's not a whole lot. They they kind of needed some major help at third base, and that's kind of the consequence for them, not investing in their farm system at all with clearly nothing coming up. So they went out, got Moustakas, and then they also went out and got the um, – and got Eduardo Escobar from, from the Mets. So, you know, it's just – you know, it comes, it comes to show you just – it's hard to pitch at Cordes Field. I mean, the only guy – for the Rockies, who actually was able to do it and do it and did it well for about a year or two, was Ubaldo Jimenez. Okay, George. 
Well, the Angels are putting in a nice little season. They're six games above 500. Uh, boy, isn't there a mercy rule at Coors Field? Come on, Jordan. Those games should be called when they're that rowdy. <laughs> or how about that World's College World Series score? There's another one that was off the charts. But uh, all kidding aside, no, I know it's been a tough year for Iraqi fans, and obviously – uh, there's still quite a ways to go, but um, no, it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's just unreal when teams put up those kind of numbers, Scott. Especially like you said in the first few innings, I, I really think that uh, California, the I mean the LA Angels, got a long way to go before they can prove that they're going to be uh, challenging for the pennant. But uh, right now they're enjoying it, and um, what can I say? You know, they had a hell of a game. All I'll say is they're just playing to keep Otani, will show a Otani. Yeah. I don't know whether that'll be enough, but that's all I can say. All right, the man of the hour, Jordan Long. Honestly, I'm not surprised how bad the Rockies were. I mean, they, they've had a lot of young guys get called up, but they gave up a franchise record 13 runs in the third inning. I remember I was looking at the score that night. I'm like, that can't be right. And then I looked, I'm like, yeah, it's right. <laughs> As for the Angels, I mean, they're, they are a winning team right now. They have a chance to actually, you know, um, make a wild card spot. And the thing with the Rockies, like, or with the Angels, and Eric definitely said it, they have, you know, injuries. So you had to move Moustakis. At least the Rockies got a prospect, which is insane. I think he's in the highest day right now. So we don't know how that's going to, you know, transpire, but at least we got something back. A lot of times the Rockies do these trades – if you look at the Nolan Arenado trade, for instance, they didn't get a whole lot back. At least it's something back for him. So at least they did something smart with Moustak and saying, you know, you're a veteran. Go out and help a team win because you're not going to do it in Colorado this year. Okay, well, first of all, Jeremy, well, you're the man of the hour when it comes to reading this, especially when my voice is starting to get hoarse. I'm sorry, Jordan, but the Angels made the Rockies look like a single-A team and the Rocky struggles continue. Tell me how you really feel, Will. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you could just say the Rockies got rocked that night. Yeah, that's true, too. They did. Like yeah, Rocky, Rocky all, Mountain rocked. Yeah. We could, we could use all the analogies to describe what took there. It was a Rocky Mountain low for the Rockies that day. Mm -hmm. All right. So, all right, Jeremy, go ahead. Well, uh, my my deepest sympathies to the guy that put out that ticker on the on the news channel prior to to take the Rockies to win outright over the Angels before this game was played. That was probably the worst take I've seen on a news broadcast ever. That being said, go, go figure. A team that plays close to sea level goes to Mile High City and cranks out home runs at an alarming rate. <laughs> Pitchers go to the Colorado to die for their careers. Yeah, the only one that didn't was Mike Hampton, who loved going there to hit home runs out of Coors Field. Remember that one, Jordan? Yep, I remember when uh, the Rockies signed Denny Nagel and Mike Hampton. I think that was 2000. We were all excited here and didn't really work out. I mean, yeah, but you know what? Mike Hampton enjoyed playing there. He was – here's a, he's a – I like this guy here, Jordan. There's a guy that may not had a – Horrible run on the mound, okay, but boy, you love hitting those dingers out of Coors Field mile high. He embraced the altitude. Nobody else would. It was, I think it was just as fun to watch Mike Hamp Hampton hit home runs in Coors Field. Yeah, that's so, true. I just wish he would have pitched better, but hey, that's not here or there. Jim, yeah, Jim well, Leland. Jim he did Leland. things in reverse order is what he did. Jim, exactly. Let's not forget that Todd Helton and Larry Walker were outstanding in the, in the mile mm -hmm. high city. Yes, they but, were. Don't, yeah, don't. but I'll tell you, Mike Hampton was entertaining. And you know yeah. what, Jordan? I'm trying to rescue you and throw a little positivity at you. you know Even Matt right? Holliday. Matt yep. A young Matt Holliday was good there, too. Got him to the World Series. Yep. And it, yeah. where he technically didn't touch the plate, but I'm not going to argue it. It doesn't matter. He doesn't matter. You still got through, you still got through that series. We did. Also, <laughs> don't, for, don't forget, though, Jim Leland managed for a year there because he describes himself as a pitcher's manager, barely lasted a year there because he was well, tired of seeing I think he lasted him. a year in there. I was there, yeah. then he knew to get mm -hmm. out of there. Yep. But, Jordan, I'm trying to instill some positivity. Larry Walker, Todd Helton. It Holiday. wasn't all bad, but this game was. Yeah, bad. it was. I can bring up a bad yeah. name from the beginning. Scott Aldridge. Yeah. Anything else you want to add to this one, Jeremy? 
<laughs> no, I, mean, I can't. I can't. I can't. Because, you know, as much as we want to dig on the Rockies, at least they play in a division that's competitive, unlike the AL Central, where the best that's team true. is two games over 500. That's true. Yeah, same, with, same with the NL oh, Central. Oh, don't make fun matter. of my AL Central. Stop it. <laughs> that's not making fun. That's speaking Everybody's facts. in contention. <laughs> Everybody's in contention except the Royals. Yeah. yeah. The uh-huh. Royals got to look up to see the bottom of the league in other divisions. That's true. They all right, it. well, all right, let's let's put Jordan out of the way. You don't have to worry. We won't talk about it anymore. But I had no choice but to put this bad boy in. You did. All right. So Aaron Judge torn ligament in his toe. Ouch! That hurts. Still dealing with pain, walking out. He's out indefinitely. Are the Yankees in trouble, Mister Yankee Cats? Oh boy, I just didn't want you to bring this up, but you did. Um, oh, it's called journalism 101. But <laughs> I, um, well, it's, it's, I will, I mean, unless they get an impact bat at the trade deadline, then I'd say, yeah, because that offense has been struggling. There's no way they can win. It's at the sustained pace. I mean, yeah, they have great, they have the best bullpen in baseball. They have the, they have art, they've got a, you know, not the, not the best starting rotation, but a pretty good starting rotation, you know, overall. I mean, yeah, it's got, it's had some guys get hurt, but Carlos Rodon's coming back very soon. So that should help. Um, but I, but yeah, I mean, they need help offensively. I mean, you can't just, I mean, John Carl Stanton's in a deep slump. DJ LeMay, he's starting to look, starting to, is starting to age. And also you can't just rely on Harrison Bader to do it all. And Glaber Torres is also streaky. So unless they got to get themselves an impact bat there, I mean, otherwise, you know, they may make the, they may make the playoffs, but you know, but I don't see them going anywhere if they do. Okay. George. Of course they're going to be hurt by that. You don't take 60 home runs out of a lineup and uh, recover very rapidly from that. So uh, it's a shame. I mean, he's a great ball player. He's a great gate attraction. Everywhere he goes around the league, it uh, it draws fans in cities like Kansas City and Detroit and Minnesota. And uh, it's a shame, but I hope uh, he can get over this. And uh, But, yeah, it's going to be a, a negative impact on the Yankees' chances. That's for darn sure in a very competitive division that they sit in. Jordan. I have to agree with Eric and George. I mean, this is definitely a tough injury to come back from, especially since you're missing his big bat that, you know, he had 60 home runs, 60 plus home runs last year. The thing is though, we're only in June. There's still plenty of time for, you know, them to get healthy or like Eric said, get a bat at the trade deadline. You're only a half a game behind the uh, third wild or you're, you're basically in the cusp of the wild card spot. Like Eric said, though, even if they get in, they're not going to do a whole lot. So basically, your chances really rest on if he can come back, if Judge can come back 100%. Otherwise, it's not looking too good for the Yankees' chances in the postseason. Jeremy. So you're telling me the Yankees are struggling again another year after <laughs> the retirement of Derek Jeter, the captain. Oh, my. That being said, Injuries have happened to Aaron Judge every year of his career. Injuries have happened to Juan Carlos Stanton ever since he left the Marlins. He, they've both been injury prone. You have that type of power in a bat that produces RBIs. You remove him from a lineup and it becomes, well, the Tigers, a bunch of seven through nine hitters. Right. Oh, yeah. That's, that's what you really got, right, Jeremy? So, yeah, I don't know. As far as I'm concerned with Aaron Judge, you know, he had an incredible year last year. I think at times, though, throughout his career, durability has come into question from time to time. But this could not have come at a worse time for not only Aaron Judge, but you kind of make wonder about Aaron Boone a little bit, too. You know, I'm not throwing anything out there. But there's a guy by the name of Don Manningly who's available, okay? And I don't know, Hal Steinberg is not one of those that pulls plug too quick, but Don Mattingly is still out there. I'm just saying. Okay. Now, off to the north side. Chicago Cubs chairman Dom Tom Ricketts talks deadline strategy. Obviously, we're buyers there. Cats, do you believe it? No, I don't. I mean, I mean, they're you know, they're they're in third place, but they're just doing it because the other two teams behind them are really are really bad. I just, you know, I don't, I can't see them being a buyer. 
I mean, there's a Marcus Stroman. I mean, why is Marcus Stroman attached to all these rumors of being traded? Yeah, he's got that opt out, which he's more than likely going to use it, given given that given what pitchers are fishing are fetching on the market these days. But the guy, you know, you know, Marcus Stroman himself has said how much he loves playing in Chicago, and and think and if that if that doesn't tell you enough, you know, he bought he bought um, video games for all his teammates. So if that tells you, you know, if that tells you, you know, why is this guy connected to rumors? I can't. I mean, naturally, Tom Rick is going to come out saying, "Yeah, we're yeah, we're buyers," because no one's going to straight up admit that they're a seller. They're not going to do it. They're, that's essentially telling the fans we are throwing in the towel and we are going nowhere. You know, I know, um, I know that they um, that they're not have that they're ha- that they're at least semi competitive. But to be truthful, something's off about them. I know, um, I know the Yankees have actually been rumored to be looking at Cody Bellinger a little bit, who's been having kind of a, a nice bounce back year a little bit for for them. But no, I cannot buy them as a as a buyer because no owner or general manager, not e- not even the not even the, the ro- except for maybe the Royals and possibly the Tigers. You know, no one's going to straight up come up on come up on TV and say we're selling because that essentially tells the fans we give up. It also hurts the bottom line, especially in Tom Rickett and Tom Ricketts world. George. Well, come on. They're only three games out of first place. I mean, uh, yeah, Eric, they got a lot of problems, but uh, they're still in the thick of the race. And you'd be you'd be crazy if you were an owner or a general manager telling people now that you're going to sell off the team or sell off, peel off guys and, and put them up there for trade. Um, you know, they're doing as best they can right now, and, and it's a close race with, uh, obviously, Milwaukee in there. And, uh, you know, I, I <laughs> the Reds, it's going to be an interesting race. That's all I can say. But, no, uh, I, I don't believe that they're going to be uh, buyers either, but it's too early to rule that out. Let's see how things go in the month of July, at least the first part of the month of July for the Cubbies, because uh, the the fans are just great fans there in Chicago, terrific fans at Wrigley Field, as we know. And uh, I know they're dying for another uh, chance at a at a at an Ash League pennant. Now, George, I want you to read actually Will's comments. If you don't mind, in this particular. All story. right, sure. I think the Cubs are just saying this to make headlines, and the Cubs are going to more likely. S- be sellers than buyers, but I think they're staying put. All right. I don't, all right. You know what? The yeah. reason why I had you do it is I wanted Jordan to get first crack at Will's comments, and then Jeremy, you can say it afterwards. Jordan, you're probably more familiar with a lot of this stuff from what you come across, so go ahead. I mean, I think Tom Ricketts, like George said, they're only three games back in the National League Central Division. There's still a chance that they could end up winning the division. I know that's that's really hard to say because the other teams are playing so well. Right. The thing is, though, is I do agree with George that it comes down to what will they do that do in the first part of July and after the All Star break. That'll determine more. Right now, though, I would say stay put. I don't think Tom Rick should have said anything. I could see them being sellers at the at the trade deadline because I just don't see them you know, having the team to uh, go to the postseason or to win the division. I just think you're going to be sellers more than buyers. But Tom Ricketts has to say this because you don't want to give fans, you know, belief that disbelief that you're not going to be competitive. Good point. All right, Jeremy, close out the topic. As an owner, it's sometimes your job to make the team look good. And this is a time when he shouldn't have because they're looking okay, like everybody said. The other two teams are so abysmal that they should be in the AL Central with the rest of us bottom feeders. That being said, <laughs> that being said, uh, if the Cubs were in the AL Central, they'd be in second place and only behind by a game. So they're not that bad of a team because they play in a good division that's way more competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're what behind the Cubs? I mean, uh, the Reds, Reds and St. Louis? No, Reds and Brewers. Reds and Brewers. Okay. Hey, the Brewers are a good team. They're all right. Okay. But all right. at the same time, they're not great teams. Right. They're, they're teams that are going to make the playoffs. And I, I have a parting shot later, if I can, that has to do well, with you're gonna, you're, okay. Yeah, we're really running well on time, so we will get around to parting shots tonight. Okay, let's go on to the next topic. First, I'm going to go over first place teams and their payroll rank. Okay. 
first one National League East. Atlanta, 202 million. 222,623, they're eighth. AL West, Texas, we've got 197,800,318, so 197 million or so. Well, we'll just say rounding up to 198 million. We'll just get rounding up numbers. AL Central, Minnesota Twins, 153,664,316. Forget about that. NL West, Arizona, 114, 465, 238. They're 21st. Minnesota was ranked 17th. Texas, 9th. And, of course, Atlanta was 8th. We'll go on to the National League Central. The surprising Cincinnati Reds, 93,206,466, 25th. And last but not least, this wouldn't surprise anybody. In the American League, Tampa Bay, 76,932,532, 32, 28th. All I can tell you is I don't know what the Rays are doing there, but they're the, they're they're the best when it comes to this low budget thing. I don't know if there's a team any better. All right, Eric, let's start off. Well, we know about the Rays. They're always going to come out with good teams every year. Like I said, I think they're the city. They deserve more than they're receiving from from the Tampa area. Um, you know, because they are truly a competitive team. These guys will literally develop players, and they will find these guys out of nowhere. They will literally dig these guys out of the ground. And they'll play really, really well, you know. As far as um, as far as the Braves go, you know, you know, the Braves are the Braves. They, you know, they they had a they had a run where they just had a really good run drafting and scouting and things like that. You know, that's that's how that's how they are. It seems like they they find they develop pitchers out of like no like no tomorrow in that division. You know, they ever since they won, ever since they won the World Series, it's been you know they've had great great momentum in that division. And I always said that they are probably the better team, one of the better teams in the National League. All right. Well, this comment up here is from LinkedIn, Eric Sykes. It looks like to me. Thank, I love the show because it's not boring. Well, you know what, Eric? I want to thank you very much for being a part of it. Really big time. People like you. We, we Like I mentioned, we're getting people coming off of LinkedIn, our YouTube channel, Twitter. And, of course, I get the aftermath of the uh, Twitter. And then, of course, I find out about it on Facebook. So, Eric, thank you very much for coming in. We greatly appreciate it. Okay. George, go ahead. Well, Tampa Bay, obviously, uh, is the cream of the crop. I mean, you know, they do it with uh... – with the meager uh, payroll that they have. Uh, they've got great development of their young players. They've got good scouting and they've got a great big league manager. Oh, did I forget analytics? Yeah, they know how to use analytics too. So Tampa Bay is again showcasing what a fine organization they are. And this is despite a lukewarm at best fan support, obviously, where they play. Uh, the, the other teams I'm not too, too surprised with. Atlanta, like you said, Eric, they've always been a good team. They have a lot of talent. They've got a good front office, too. And, um, you know, some of these other teams, of course, Texas has been known to spend heavily and, and not produce anything. They still don't have a World Series triumph uh, for that franchise at all since it moved to Texas. I, I think this is a good time to just say that money will not buy you happiness in Major League Baseball, okay? But it's hard to get it through the thick skulls of a lot of these owners. Uh, you're listening Mets, and are you listening uh, San Diego and teams like that? But, I mean, the season's long. We know that. But, yeah, some of these are astonishing, Scott. The, the numbers you, you told us, these yeah. teams are just, you know, some of them are just unbelievable the way they manage it, and obviously <laughs> Tampa Bay takes the cake. All right, Jordan, please we'll read Will Vogel's comments and then comment on your own. The Rays are the best on that list. They develop their own players, and Braves are always contending in the National League. As for the Rays, I mean, like uh, George said, they don't have a lot of fan support, but they do develop their team, and they're always in the thick of that uh, American League East division. As for the Braves, I mean, that doesn't surprise me that they're in first place because of – you know, they have talent in the money they spend, but it also shows you, like George said, the Mets, the Padres, the Dodgers who aren't in first place that are spending all this kind of money. They're not in the thick of, well, they're in the thick of the race, but they're not in first place. So money does not buy winning and how you do it is by your farm system. And the Rays are the best at doing that. That's what you have to do in baseball today is yes, you can buy all the veterans you want, but you still have to develop the farm system. And that's what the Rays do over and over again, and that's why they're always in the thick of the race. I have a new name for the Tampa Bay Rays. Ready? Yeah. 
the Tampa Bay magicians. <laughs> because you know, yeah. <laughs> they find these guys. No, no, they're incredible. Tampa Bay musicians. Yeah, it's All a right. good one. The magicians, I meant. All right, Jeremy, you have final word on this one. Thank God the Rays are really good at scouting because what that means, not only is their farm system good, but their scouting department is heads and shoulders above everybody else because otherwise they'd have payrolls over the 120 mark like everybody else that's doing this type of production. The fact they're able to do it with $76 million, that's no different than the Yankees' budget for duct tape and gauze. <laughs> I, I'm not going to top that. I'm not going to try. I, I'm taking the fifth. That doesn't happen. All of me. You just did it this time. Ball right. All right. All right. Last topic. And then everybody else have parting shots. MLB views UK as gateway to European growth with eyes on Paris and Germany. All right, Eric. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's fantastic that they're playing these games overseas because I remember back in the day, really, the only places they would go are Puerto Rico, maybe the DR and Japan. But, you know, now they're starting to hit up Europe, which to me is awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see that they're doing it. I know that they tried it with the Yankees and the Red Sox back in 2019, which was a lot of fun. Well, this time they got the walls right, so we're not watching home runs left and right where it looks where baseball scores look like football scores. Um I think, um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's fantastic to see the game go kind of, kind of see the game go global. We see players every so often coming from d different countries outside the Americas and, you know, and so it's just cool how we're seeing the game grow over there. George. Yeah, I agree with, uh, your analysis, Eric. Um, baseball seems to be lagging behind, uh, you know, through no fault of anybody's, I guess, but the NHL, the NBA and the NFL have been going to Europe for a long, long time. And uh, I know that this trip got postponed because of COVID, uh, the London series, that is, that was just played last weekend. But I think that, uh, yeah, they ought to look into Paris, France. And like you mentioned, Scott, Germany, they're thinking of too, Manfred, the commissioner. You have to do that. There are so many players from so many different nations. It is an international sport. The World Baseball Classic is one of the best ones we had ever, probably the best ever this past spring down in Florida and sites elsewhere around the world that hosted games. So, yeah, I'm happy for it. You know, even a two to three trips a year maybe to Europe. And, uh, you know, I think it's a great thing for baseball to do this. Okay, you know what? I'm going to let Jordan uh, do Will's comments and you can follow it up again. A few years ago when the Red Sox played Yankees and this year Cardinals versus Cubs, it's good to see games go overseas like the NFL does every year with games in London and Germany. As for growing the game, I mean, there's a lot of international players anyway on these rosters. Like George said, we had the World Baseball Classic, which was the best. I watched uh, the Cubs and the Cardinals on Saturday, and that ballpark was full. I mean, it's nice to see the game grow globally, and I think – doing it in Paris and moving it to Germany. It's just nice to see them go into these markets that the NFL has been doing for years. So I think growing the game globally is the best way to do because like uh, George said, the NBA does it, the NHL is doing it. And of course the NFL do it, does it. So it's successful for, the, for them. So why not be successful for them, for well, the we'll uh, MLB? Yeah, we'll double on Will's comments. Sandy does games in Asia and Paris, and everybody knows about the NFL and how they're growing it. So Will follows it up. All right, Jeremy. Well, what led him to this is Nielsen ratings. If you look at the World Series last year, the 18% of the people outside of the United States that watched the World Series was in Western Europe, which right. means it was the UK, France, and Germany predominantly, which are the highest population outside of Spain and Portugal. So, yes, it's very smart for them to do that, to tap into, because those stadiums over there are much bigger than any of the stadiums over here. So the ticket pricing can be half the price, yet produce three times the amount of money that a full stadium would at a, at a well-followed team. You know, Jeremy, that's a really great point. I never thought about it. You're talking about a game that drew, what, 54000 and. London over the weekend. Yeah. How often are you going to see 54,000 United States? Uh, not in the AL Central unless you're the Twins. No. You know what, Jeremy? I don't think you're going to see 54,000 many ballparks here because many of them are 35, 40,000. Right. I know, I know you're trying to get a 
choke out of it. But this is one of those things where you're you made such a good comment that there's a lot of meat to this comment is what you just did. You know, a lot of them are now between 30, 35,000, some in some case 40, but 54,000, really. Good point, Jeremy. I like that. All right. Well, with that said, we have parting shots. I'll go last. Go ahead, Eric. Well, my parting shot is, man, in order for the in order for the Brewers, don't trade Corbin Burns. Just don't do it. You saw what happened with Josh Hader last year, and you're, it was so unpopular with the locker room that the team was absolutely lifeless, even though the Phillies were literally handing them the a playoff spot, but they couldn't get it done because that team was just so dead without Josh Hader. Just don't trade him. Go for it this year. Wait for the offseason. Besides, Burns is not having the Burns is not the same pitcher that he had been the past couple of years. This year, just just leave it, let it be, and let and just and just try and go for a playoff spot. The playoffs are a game of roulette. Just play, George. Will the baseball gods please give the Detroit Tigers a break when it comes to pitching? Uh, now, Matthew Boyd, Tommy John surgery. Leaves the game last night. We spent $10 million to get this kid back from Seattle. And look what happens. Yet another Tiger starting pitcher goes on the shelf. We're sick of it here in Detroit. I don't know what's going on. They made a complete renovation of their training department over the offseason. And uh, we're still having all these problems with these Tiger pitchers. All these young pitchers they drafted, every one of them has gotten hurt. And now even a veteran like Matthew Boyd. Please, please, let's stop the hemorrhaging as far as the pitching staff goes with the Detroit Tigers. All right, quick comment. Eduardo P., thank you very much. Give us a thumbs up. We appreciate all the positive comments that we can get from a lot of bases. So, Eduardo, thank you so much. Okay, go ahead, George. Excellent. Can you pitch for us, Eduardo? <laughs> <laughs> you so, know, you could. <laughs> so there's been talk about should the Rockies fire Bud Black right now. And honestly, if you look at it, the Rockies, like we've talked about, are struggling. They stand at uh, 31 and 49. The problem with doing a firing right now is it's not going to do anything. The Rockies are so terrible that they're not going to make the postseason. They're they're too far back. I think the best course of action, I know Bud Black has one year left on his contract. You wait until the end of the year, and then the general manager, which is um, – the general manager can then pick his own guy because it, this is Bill, – Sh Bill Schmidt is the general manager. This was not his guy. Let Bud Black finish the year, even though that he has one year left. Fire him then. Pay off that year. And don't let him manage next year and then have you pick your guy at the end of the season because, like I said, we're not going anywhere right now. Just do it at the end of the year. It just makes so much more sense because if he's back next year, the Rockies aren't going to compete anyway. So might as well just let him go, cut clean, and start over next year. Okay, Jeremy. Oh, we're talking about another player that was drafted by – the dreaded ex-general manager of the Tigers, Al Avila, being injured. If you look at the first round draft picks that Al Avila has made, including number one dash one, Spencer Torkelson, they've been less than stellar and been downright almost dismal. He's striking out at a 24% clip, which is 21% for the average in the NFL. You've got all these guys that just are not competing at the level we expected them to. And we have guys in the farm system that aren't developing as fast as they should, which shows me that the coaching in the farm system isn't right anymore. Because at one time, but prior to Dave Dombrowski being here, we had the best farm system in baseball rated in the baseball 100. Now we can't find us in the baseball 200. <laughs> wow. I, I have an interesting comment, but it's a little bit more lighthearted. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was watching the London game last Saturday. You know, it was pretty neat. Alex Rodriguez, Eric Jeter, and David Poppy. And Derek Jeter's birthday, so what do you think Poppy does? Mm -hmm. He gives Derek Jeter a jersey with the Boston Red Sox. Let me tell you, folks. I enjoy it. I really do. You have bitter rivals on a major network, and Kevin Burkhart was there front and center to stand. I loved it. What we can do is say what we want about the Yankees rivalry, what the Boston Red Sox. So when you see these guys here exchanging a light and moment, we need more like that. 
and I really enjoy the. You know, we can talk about whether the Red Sox and Yankees is what it, it doesn't matter. They're all getting paid good money, anyways. You know, two great markets, and to me, Fox clearly has it right with all their properties, and I was really happy to see all of that come together on Saturday. More power to them. Happy birthday, Derek Jeter. It would have, you know, what Kimming is doing is great, but I still wish you would have another opportunity to take a longer crack at it. But as it turns out, you're appearing all over the place on commercials anyhow, and now you got a TV gig. Life isn't bad for Derek Jeter. Just like life has been very good with this crew here on 108 Stitches Baseball Talk as well. So with that said, I'm going to let everybody know how Eric can get a hold of himself. Yes, you can follow me on my Twitter at Sports Scene News, or you can read read my blog at bellyupsports.com where I'm writing all things baseball. Well, uh, you know, George, you're going to be last. Okay. Go ahead, Jordan. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Sports Scoop One. I have a blog that I write Mondays through Thursdays with podcasts on Fridays at sports scoop.com. Besides being here on the South Florida Tribune on 108 Stitches, you can find me on all the Sideline Sports Network shows, including Pundits Pundit, which airs tomorrow. Jeremy. Well, first and foremost, you can find me on YouTube at the South Florida Tribune dot channel where Scott may need me for anything from football to baseball to general sports to anything out there, including our own show, Professor and the Pupil. You can also find me on the South Florida Tribune dot com where you'll find me under a list of great authors like Scott Morgan Roth and George Icorn, where you see my writings about the NFL and the Detroit Lions. You can also find me on my YouTube channel, which is Kneecap Biting with the Detroit Lions, where I do two shows a week during the offseason, one covering the NFL, one covering the Lions. Why? Because I can. And then you can find me on Sideline Sports with my show, The Jeremy Balrick Show, interviewing podcasters, fans, and former NFL play- NFL and sports players. And, of course, Jeremy and I have our show on Sunday Professor and the Pupil, and Jacob Christner is going to be making some appearances on there as well. And the intent is to have Jeremy Balrick go ahead and make appearances on Basket Bros as well. I'm trying to get Jeremy as well-rounded as I can. I have to get him ready for next summer. So when he goes with me to the National Sports Media Association, he's not going to be a one-trick pony. So I'm just trying to make sure that Jeremy gets as much exposure in a lot of different areas. All right. Well, Mr. Author. Author, author, I still have copies of Detroit Sports Broadcasters on the air available. There's a link to the uh, book to purchase it at the end of my column. As Jeremy mentioned, uh, co-writer for the Motor City Tribune under the South Florida Tribune banner. Scott is in the book interviewing uh, Muhammad Ali and Jimmy Connors. And it's a nice gift if anybody wants to order one. Um, you can find me here on the South Florida Tribune channel. You can read me in the Detroit Monitor. You can reach me at GICorn at Yahoo.com. You can reach me on LinkedIn. And you can reach me, of course, at Twitter at SandGSports99. And I uh, love these shows. Anytime I'm on them, I enjoy them. So thanks again, Scott, for having me on. You're welcome, George. Just a programming note, there will be no show next Tuesday, July 4th. I want everybody to have an opportunity to enjoy the holiday and there's a strong possibility we won't do anything on Wednesday the 5th, but I'm not sure yet. But for sure, nothing on the 4th. You, what you could expect to see on that night, however, will be this show. I'll go out there and put it on social media instead because there's certainly a lot of developments that will take place. So a lot of what we're doing is still going to be relatively current to what next week should be all about. With that said, I should point out one more time that 108 Stitches Baseball Talk is being broadcast around the world. The audio version of the show can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a good guest? I see a bunch of them in this chat room. You can follow suit. Jeremy Allright handles a lot of those. Is what he does to make sure we just have to coordinate it in the schedule. Are you going to either go make, or earn your way into the chat room or send your topic ideas to southfordtribune at gmail.com? If you want to advertise cost efficiently, call me at 954 304 4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website is www.southfordtribune.com. Twitter at Tribune South. Candy Evelyn is behind the scenes, whether she's on shows, whether she's putting stuff on the website, etc. We appreciate her work. Also, coming later this summer, the Motor City Mad Mouth show will be debuting on the Eagle Court Media Studios. 
in Boca Raton, Florida, owned by Dr. Edwin Hernandez. We'll keep you posted. Just a little, give you a little information about them. The Eagle Corporation is a technology-based company in Palm Beach County. So I'm really looking forward to it. I was just recently named the director of broadcasting for Eagle, and I'm working for, looking forward to working with Dr. Hernandez as he w- wants to try to utilize the experience that I've had in this industry so that we can try to make sure that the South Florida Tribune is going to be connected to the Eagle Corporation. All we're looking to do is find out what their technology will do in, in, a, in an effort to connect both of them so we can drive traffic to the website shows, et cetera. So this is a joint partnership between Dr. Hernandez and myself. And as George will tell you, he knows how much I like taking on new challenges and building them from the ground up. And I expect this to be a wonderful partnership because Dr. Hernandez and I have a great deal of mutual respect, but none of this could have been made possible without my good friend, Dan Gudima as well who actually recommended my name to Dr. Hernandez. And we've been working on this project for the last seven weeks until Dr. Hernandez and I came to terms last Thursday. So just wanted to put that out there so you have a little idea that a lot of the talent I have here on the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network will have opportunities to join me there and enhance their opportunities as well. And I'm proud of every person in this system. And I look forward to making sure they have opportunities to get more exposure everywhere. So just wanted to put that out there. So meanwhile, great job to my incredible crew. So on behalf of Eric Katz, excuse me, George Eichhorn, Jordan Long, Jeremy Balreich, my name is Scott Morgan, Roth the Motor City, Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this edition of 108 Stitches Baseball Talk. And a special shout out to everybody in the chat room. You were, you did a dynamite job. We appreciate every last comment from the first letter to the final punctuation mark. And we look forward to seeing you back on this very show in about two weeks. Happy July 4th, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>